I guess most of you would be aware that something is going on down the South Island if you just be sort of looking at the media. But I've put in a fairly small selection here of various headlines which appeared recently and earlier on. Um, so a whole range of variations. So amongst other things, it's been suggested that um, Onslow might even cause the crash of the share prices as contact Mercury did with Guinness and so forth. And I mean, that paper has got to be worthwhile knowing a little bit about like this. Um, so it ranges everything from an incredible plan to a really bad idea. So I'll sort of work through it if you make up your own mind on how things might be going. The first couple of acknowledgements, um, out of thanks to the power companies, had a lot of support over the years in my country for Kansas, and also um, really heavy support for a five-year um, term at uh, the Waikato University as a senior research fellow in applied hydrology. And hopefully, we've given something back to the companies too with respect to my, my research students and the few um, subjects that we've got down there in terms of what we've achieved, partially funded by the um, power companies. Also, I think research. Yasmin is here, I'm a current student. Helen Bajin has completed a PhD on onslow pump storage, which I guess is the definitive works uh, thus far. Um, Yasmin is looking at um, water resources and environmental impacts of onslow rather than onslow itself. And uh, I'd like to give a personal recognition here to the onslow farmers who I know have been impacted severely by the indecision that's been going on um, around the, you know, whether or not onslow is going to advance or not. And uh, hopefully I can meet them at some stage and give a presentation um, down at Bradbury and, and Alexandra. It's very easy to get it. And so mm -hmm. yeah. hopefully that sounds a little bit better. Okay, so this is the outline of the, the presentation. I'll go through the, some the basics of pump storage on those schemes, a few misconceptions, and what's happening between dry years. Mostly I'll be talking about the Onslow climate change and the environment, which is what Yasmin's thesis is all about, to wind up with a few mentions of the school of science. Um, okay, just a quick revision of what pump storage is all about. In an electricity market, the basic idea is that you um, buy power, whether it's cheap, you pump water up, and when you run it back down, you sell. At the end of that exercise, of course, there will be a net energy loss, but hopefully there will also be a bit many gains. This is an indicative typical pump storage scheme. They're usually pretty big. A recently opened um, pump storage scheme over in Switzerland is outlined down there, 900 megawatts, what else? Cost 3 billion, took 14 years to construct. Some that was rather similar, or probably will be rather similar, but with one noticeable difference. You can see here the storage capacity, 20 gigawatt hours to the Swiss facility, 5,000 gigawatt hours to the Now that's pretty dramatic. So the way Onslow obtains that additional energy is by a combination of high altitude and also a large operating range for a lower level of 700 meters. Um, keep that uh, number in mind, we'll come back to it later. And probably going up to around about 765 meters. So that's a 65 meter operating range as compared to 10 meters on a typical hydro lake in the South Island. So this is the effect it would have. So the left bar there represents the current uh, hydro storage capacity in New Zealand, most of which is in the South Island. And the right bar is how much it would change by if we added Onslow into the mix. And that enhanced energy storage capacity will give us the storage buffer over a future dry, calm, and flooding time. It's a different generation. The operation would be pretty simple. 
you pump water backwards and forwards from the Kruip River up to Lake Onslow. Uh, those two lines there, the blue is the lower level and the yellow is the upper level. And the, uh, the water is always available from the Kruip River. You never use the same water twice. So and there's no lower reservoir in that sense. Well, in terms of it might be a longer, a longer uh, tunnel through to the uh, Lake Rock. Luckily, the Kluth River is our largest by flow, so there's always going to be plenty of water available. Just where it is, if you look carefully on the width forecast, you will see two dots. And Onslow is the left of those two dots. Okay, how does it all start? And where is it going? I guess the first public recognition of Onslow was a little note that I wrote back in 2005, looking at the potential of the pump um, storage. Um, uh, capacity of the Lake Onslow Basin. Whoops. Um, the, back then, the electricity demand was pretty static. It wasn't growing, and there was no suggestion of ending thermal um, power generation. And if Onslow was constructed, it would reduce um, hydro still somewhat. And that's how things more or less stayed right through to 2019. And that's when the things changed in terms of the imperatives and the emissions reduction that then became a new priority, which was not even thought about back in 2005. So the Interim Climate Change Committee picked up on the potential of uh, energy storage like Onslow as a way towards enabling us to go through to 100% renewable electricity. 2020 in July, the government put that in as part of its uh, election priority. And through to September, it actually brought that forward a little bit in the sense of bringing forward the time of 100% renewable power to 2030 based on Onslow being able to be constructed. And they, they, they put a total of about $100 million, mostly towards Lake Onslow revisions, sorry, reviews. Um, the uh, the situation of having static electricity demand is going to change dramatically going into the future because we're going to move to, through the green transition to using electricity, particularly for industrial heat and transport. So things are changing dramatically. And the new power is going to come from intermittent generation, particularly wind. And that's when Onslow is going to come into its own, being able to back up wind. And also, of course, take us through a dry year because we still get most of our power coming through from hydro. So Onslow is often thought about as a dry year. Too hot for me. It operates by being able to make excessive use of wet and windy years. If Onslow is not there and we go through to our green transition, we're going to have massive uh, spill of wind and water in wet years. And where are we now? Oh, well, as of July 7, um, the statement came out from the government that Onslow has passed through technical um, feasibility, which is not well, initial technical feasibility, it's still going on. And in August 10, uh, Megan Woods stated that I'm scheduled to report back to the cabinet in December 2022, and that report will, will include a complete feasibility analysis of Onslow. So that's where things stand. We probably won't hear a lot more about it until maybe early next year. There are other dry year alternatives to Onslow um, under investigation. And so we uh, have to ask the question there whether or not um, Onslow uh, is going to go ahead. The alternatives are fixable geothermal and biomass. Um, I don't see either of those working, actually, because flexible geothermal is almost like a contradiction of terms. Geothermal is not flexible. It comes away at a constant rate. Biomass would be very expensive. That means effectively a pile of wood with Huntley. And I don't see that those two options can do very much between dry years. The other one being looked at is hydrogen. The two options for that is green hydrogen and interruptible large scale uh, systems in the south. Just to explain that. Okay, the left one first is the hydrogen storage option. So the idea is simply we make green hydrogen for green electricity in normal years, we store the green hydrogen, and in a dry year, we convert the green hydrogen. Up to now, that's a non-starter right from the very beginning. The weakness there is if you want 5,000 gigawatt hours of green hydrogen storage, you would need another 5,000 gigawatt hours to offset the inefficiencies. It's never going to happen, but for some reason, it's still possible. Uh, just things out. Um, the other option is, uh, assuming that TY is still um, is going to get, still be with us, there's a large hydrogen plant um, in South Africa. 
So that's going to be powered by a large multiple wind farm. In a normal year, um, those wind farms will provide power to, to the hydrogen plant, or per perhaps for export of green hydrogen. And in the dry year, they switch around and turn off the hydrogen plant and feed into the national grid. It, it sounds sensible and reliable, but it's not. That is that you're relying on the wind blowing in Southland to take you through all the country through a dry year. And again, that's just simply a too risky. So to summarize, Megan Woods said to keep lights on in the future, we will either need to retain dependence on thermal plants or develop a solution for storing a large amount of renewable energy, i.e. on flight. Not going to be anything out there. A bunch of misconceptions are around. Let me just quickly go through these. Onslow will use up energy. Well, yes, it will, of course. It's not a perpetual matter. It will enable a net energy increase by two ways creating a small energy gain through reduced hydro spill and a large energy gain by enabling wind power. Onslow will increase transmission loss. I know it won't because it's just simply a storage device. When Lake Pukaki was raised, there was no increase in transmission, and neither would there be an increase in transmission loss um, by raising Lake Onslow. Onslow was in the wrong island. No, it's not. It has to be in the South Island because the South Island is where the hydro lakes are, and the role of Onslow is to buffer the South Island hydro lakes. If you had Onslow on the North Island, that would mean when you had a wet year in the South Island, you've got to get all that extra power through the South Island, competing with the other North Island um, movement through the Cox Plate Cable bottleneck. So that would never work. Um, big is bad. Well, that's sometimes true. Certainly, the Clyde Dam, one of the think big projects, is definitely bad, should never have been built. On the other hand, Benmore Dam, another big one, that's an asset to the country, one of our most important power generation mm -hmm. stations. Build more hydro dams instead. Um, that's not going to happen either because no one's going to accept a large dam in a valley anymore in New Zealand. And the other thing, paradoxically, the more dams you build, the greater the dry year risk because all it means is you're going to have more turbines doing nothing in a dry year. So the impact will be great. Another one that comes out sometimes, it's old technology. Something better will come along sometime, perhaps, maybe. But who wants to take the risk of that? It's much better to stick with something that you know and not have some sort of opium concept that everything will come right by technology. And also, there's a concept that Onslow commercial operation requires saving hydro spill. In fact, that's irrelevant to Onslow commercial operation in the sense of buying cheap and selling more expensive. It doesn't come into it. Okay, this is an important figure because it sort of illustrates how Onslow would interact with the environment. Now, Onslow, just keep in mind, it's, it's, it's going to be generating when power is expensive and buying, pumping when power is cheap. So it will establish a ceiling. When prices get high, Onslow will start generating, stopping the prices going any further up. When prices go down, Onslow will start pumping and that will provide a price floor. So the idea is that upper price ceiling will mean that you'll never get into a situation of requiring coal or gas, simply because it will be uneconomical um, to generate coal or gas at that price ceiling. The lower end, by having a price floor, that will be greatly assist um, wind, wind generation. The paradoxical thing about wind generation, if the wind is not blowing, obviously you can't generate income. If the wind's blowing everywhere, you still can't generate income. And the reason for that is wind can't be stored. You have to dump it onto the electricity market. So if we go back to, I think that was uh, 29th of, um, um, of July, the, you can see those um, cost figures there. The um, megawatt hour was going for two cents. That's, that's not a kilowatt hour, which is, you, your, which is your home unit. This is a megawatt hour. So you're not going to make much money from wind selling your electricity and getting back two cents per megawatt hour. So the price floor would make wind generation much more reliable and, 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 and more predictable. So hopefully the, the, the onslow will enable wind to develop much more than otherwise would have done. By the way, on this particular day, there was 200 uh, cubics of worth of flow available for pumping. That translates to about 1,000 megawatts. So if you were to bid 1,000 megawatts into that system on that day, you would find for sure that that price would be higher up. And likewise, you mentioned about the ceiling. Back in 2010, the electricity price shown here in red 
uh, was quite high, and coal burning ramped up to meet that price. Then along comes some heavy rain, price went down, and coal burning faded away again. But the thing is, if Ontario was going, that high price would never have come in in the first place, and Huntley would never have started burning coal. You also get um, low prices even without wind. So here's a situation uh, a few days back. We had an inch cyclone over the country. Here's the big low coming in that's causing rain right now on the West Coast. The price is low there too, even though there was no, no wind generation, about $4 per megawatt hour. But that's simply because there was a big peak in the, the content of Hydro Lakes. You can see they jumped up here. And I wouldn't mind betting over the next uh, few days, they'll jump up even further as the water flows, floods from the present storm into the South Island Hydro Lakes. Okay, this is a common headline you see around the place. And I always find it a little bit upsetting. Six ways you can help with climate change. The thing is, this gives you a, a false sense of empowerment. I ride around on your bicycle or whatever, and you will have some effect on New Zealand's weather and climate. Well, it just doesn't work like that. We have to, we're living in a global system, global um, atmosphere, and global ocean. So you can pedal around as much as you like, you're not going to change anything in terms of New Zealand's weather and climate. And that graph is going to keep on going up for quite a long time. Having said that, we do need to be responsible citizens, of course. But we also need to consider our own well-being and focus on what we actually can control. So, so the green uh, the green transition. Uh, can you get rid of that? Just to move your mouse to the top and move it away again. I have to go more. Click on more, and then click on scroll down, hide floating medium controls. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we need to focus on what we can control, the, uh, the climate change, which is effectively uh, climate change adaptation. So we need to realize this climate change is coming, whether we like it or not, but we can modify ourselves to some extent in order to actually keep our environment a little bit better under control. And also, importantly, we need to have the green transition giving us a somewhat better environment. That might even mean backing away from some existing renewables. Now, I'd like to contribute to this at the regional level. Now, at the national level, Just last week, the government uh, announced its Climate Change Adaptation National Plan. Now, of course, that's going to be largely on the whole country. Part of that, um, action 8.2, um, is to manage dry, dry air risk. And dry air risk has been stated. The current focus is on the feasibility of pump hydroelectricity at Lake Onza. So that's good. But importantly, Lake Onza can also come into operation at the regional level. And we'll have a look at that, with, particularly with respect to the uh, risk factor which I noted before, which was risk to local potable water supply. All right, let's just leave and do it. Um, regional change adaptation, possible future proofing of the Dunedin City urban water supply. Now, on our east coast, as we predicted, have drier conditions going into the future, and Napier and Dunedin are going to be particularly vulnerable. Notice I haven't got Christchurch there because it has a large river nearby which rises in the wetter um, west coast. Now, of course, we're all aware that if a city heads towards zero water supply, it's pretty serious uh, business. And you'll probably recall Cape Town a few years back when there was a worry that there was a day zero coming up when we would have run out of water. Fortunately, they didn't, but nonetheless, it gave you an indication of what could happen. And it really is. Ah! Can we reduce that thing? Can we can we bring the screen back? Ah, sorry. Okay, looking at the need and water supply in the bigger picture, the supply point itself comes from quite a long way away, way up here in Deep Creek. And there's a pipeline taking it all the way down through to the need. Water use is about 0.5 cubics. The um, uh, which doesn't seem a lot, but on the, on the other hand, you don't have it, it's going to be quite serious. The um, 
it raised the point of what would happen, as Ewa predicts, of having drier summer, summer um, uh, flows. The cliff, by the way, is okay because it's beside the cliff, the river which comes in from the wet west coast over there. Okay, well, we've got an indication of what could happen to the Navy water supply um, just a couple of years back when there was a fire in the water supply catchment. And they had to cut off deep stream for a while um, for water quality reasons. And that meant there was a lot of high, loss of high pressure in the higher Dunedin subdivision. So certainly, if you combine that with an even bigger drought, there's a, some, something of a risk uh, coming up. Okay, so let's go to the intake point up in uh, Deep Creek of the water supply. There it is, there's the pipe heading off towards the Eden from this weir. And up there, on that dotted line, that's a 700 meter elevation. Now, hopefully that should ring a bell from my earlier slide. And so there's Lake Onslow, where it would be if it was raised up. There's the Deep Creek intake. So there's a possibility here for putting in a narrow 17 kilometer tunnel going through. And that could act as an emergency water supply for Dunedin in the worst case scenario, if it happened that the uh, large enough drought caused the deep uh, creek to dry up. By the way, we couldn't get it from the Logan Burn Reservoir, that's just a very shallow reservoir, it doesn't uh, hold very much water. Maybe this is a task for three waters looking into the future. Keep in mind though, of course, when we pump that water up all the way from the Clutha River up into Onslow, that's going to be expensive water. So hopefully as part of Onslow, should it go ahead, will be some kind of a emergency water quota, which will give you a limited amount of water during extreme drought events um, without a massive charge being attached to it. Okay, here's the second one. The possibility of drought mitigation at um, in the Tyree River. The Tyree River in Otago, part of the sort of a dog leg, starts up here in the highlands of, our, of central Otago, works its way north, changes its mind, and then comes back and eventually flows out at Tyree Mouth uh, south of Dunedin. There's a flow gauge here up in Canadian Flat. That's about the only flow gauge which isn't impacted by draw offs further upstream. So we'll come back to that, uh, that shortly. Let's have a quick tour first down the Tyree River just to give you a sort of feeling of what it, it, it looks like. A lot of irrigation takes place on the, in the upper and middle portions. Here's the Tyree River over there in a meander belt. And all of this is irrigated land using water taken from the Tyree. So you can appreciate there's an awful lot to lose there if the Tyree was to, was to dry out. In the central portions going through some of the ranges, very attractive, cutting through the, the, the dry rough ridge country here. And some of you may have gone on the Otago uh, train through the Tyree Gorge, that's it uh, running along there. It does suffer from droughts, of course, it's a localized region, it hasn't got the west coast wet uh, rainfall coming through to it. But if you look at the hydrograph, if there's no rain, the flow falls away fairly rapidly. So it doesn't have very much base flow support. That raises the question though, given this medium flows are around about say eight cumics, could a drought be so intense as to cause um, an eight cumic river to totally dry up? Sounds like a bit like a nightmare, but uh, that nightmare is being experienced right now over in, in France. This is a Tim River, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And presently, that river has absolutely no water going in it. And the words, it's unprecedented, comes out. And that those two words probably sum up a lot of what's going on in climate change. The past is not necessarily a very good um, predictor of the future. Okay, but now let's, let's go ahead and do a standard extreme value analysis of low flow using that Canadian flat flow gauge. Now, just a clarification here, the, grid, the vertical axis is sort of upside down. It measures the discharge as the percentage below median flow. In other words, if that percentage was 100, that means the river has dried up. So these points means low flow. So by and large, the theory fits more or less well. I can fit an extreme value curve quite nicely through that data. And it looks like it's tailing off to some sort of an upper bound as the extreme value theory would, would suggest. So that's a saying that on average, we're going to have these big events or big low events, um, maybe around about 30 years on average. So perhaps there's nothing too much to worry about in terms of climate change. But with Michael, as we always say, data matching doesn't always validate the theory. So let's take that data and plot it again as a time series. 
And we see, in fact, that there's a trend in there. Now, the basic idea of extreme value analysis is that every year is just an independent event. But on the other hand, that is clearly not the case. So even though 1999 remains the lowest low, if you extrapolate it on up into the future, there might not be an upper bound or sure, be a lower bound to flow. So that's something of a, of a concern. And they said from 1999 on, there appears to be something of a change to lower uh, rainfall also around that general area. Now, so it happens that the top of the Tara headwaters is not very far from Lake Onslow. So we can potentially pull that tunnel trick again. But in this case, it's much shorter. Maybe a short three kilometer tunnel linking the upper, the expanded Lake Onslow to a tributary of the Tara River. And we could keep that tunnel as a backup against the really heavy drought in the Tari, in the Tari River. Again, you need to have some sort of a quota because that would otherwise be extensive water. So I'm not saying you should actually go ahead and let water go through because there are important water quality implications to this, i.e. there's Didymo and the Clutha River and you'd be introducing Didymo into the Tari, which would be something of a tragedy. But nonetheless, what we need to do if Andre goes ahead is to have this tunnel put in and put a big valve at the other end, and that at least will give future generations the option of having that water should they uh, so choose to do so. If we don't put it in before Onslow was raised, the opportunity is lost forever. Okay, well, Onslow itself, of course, is going to have some significant environmental impacts probably the largest of which is flooding these local wetlands. That blue line represents the new lake at its lowest possible level. That's the 700 meter level. Lots of trout, lots of solitude. It's a beautiful quiet place up there. And also there's the possibility of a large dry year drawdown exposing um, uh, lots of land which was previously underwater. Okay, so we need to have some offsets to this. But I would argue we need to offset much more in fact, it's Otago and Southland than the, than the local environmental impacts of Onslow. So I want to take you to a quick overview of what has already happened in terms of environmental impacts in Otago and Southland in respect to hydropower. Okay, out of Lake Monawa. It was raised for hydropower way back in 1926. It has a miserable four megawatts of output in the power station. And we've got 57 kilometers of stumps, drowned trees all over the place for four kilowatts, four megawatts. And that's a really major environmental impact that we could do without. Looking a bit more closely, Lake Roko is just next door, typical fjordland lake, beautiful beaches, trees in the back. Wonder why it used to look like this. This is what modern wire looks like now, just drowned stumps. The beaches are still there. They're, they're submerged, they're frozen in time, but they're down there. Probably, in this case, somewhere out around about there. But probably many in the room haven't heard of the, of the impact of the Waiau River. So I'd like to give you a kind of a Waikato analogy. Let's suppose you woke up one morning and found the Waikato River had been reduced to a small muddy stream forever. Hooker Falls have no water. There's an aluminium smelter in Auckland giving a bit of local employment, and Lake Tapa has been saved, and you're supposed to be grateful for that. Well, you wouldn't be, would you? But that's effectively what happened in the Waiau River. So this is a, a chart showing the hydrological impact. These are minimum flows, by the way. So that's before the Manipuri power station, and that's after. A dramatic impact, the biggest single impact that we have uh, uh, for a New Zealand river. People say, oh, so the Save Manipuri campaign was a great success. It wasn't. It was a failure because it failed to protect the Waiau River, which was just as important as Lake Manipuri. So this is the Waiau River now, a little stream. You can walk across if you want. Um, and where's it gone? It's been diverted, of course, down a hole to make a so called green aluminium, would you believe, um, at the TY Point Aluminium Smelter. It was once one of our largest and cleanest rivers. In fact, it was our second largest river by discharge after the cliff. And that has human impact. Just recently, there's been a delegation went up to say, don't forget our river, as if they've got much chance of changing it. And uh, but that's an ongoing issue. So the lower flows, of course, being warmer water, algal blooms, and, and so forth. Not a good look at all. Just going around, I suppose Cromwell, everybody knows about Cromwell. It's a nice track goes through there, but of course you can't go there anymore. 
I'd like how we're flooded. The older people still remember how it looked, as you can see there. There are a few who can still remember what it was like. So this green here, I've shown on the map, that's the land areas that were flooded as a consequence of Lake Lahawea being raised. The blue is Lake Lahawea as it was before it was flooded. And up here was a region of the forests of the Hunter River. Now you can still see the forests if you go up there. Here they are, or at least the very tops of them coming out. So again, there has been lots of impacts around the Otago South region. The ups and downs of the Hawea River affected the sluicing operation and cut away the river shoreline in many places. Could you imagine the uproar that would take place if that had been done as a consequence of gold mining? But because it wasn't gold mining, we're allowed to do it because simply water going up and down, hey, we need to have storage. And we do. I'm not trying to knock it. If we didn't have storage in those hydro lakes, we wouldn't be able to keep the lights on them in North Island during winter. But on though, hopefully, we'll change all that. The Hawea River, which drains out of Lake Hawea, mad fluctuation percentage wise, and you can see it going up and down all the time. And contact need to do this in order to try to balance up its limited water storage from Lake Hawea down to its hydro dams. Waitaki River, that's the second most impacted river in the South Island. What's happened there is that by holding water back in the Lake Tikitikapo and Chukaki, the seasonal variation of the lower Waikaki, lower Waikaki has been virtually eliminated. So the red line is how it is now, the blue line is how it used to be. And of course, there's issues there with water quality and so forth. There was a move a while back to actually lower the summer flows even further. There's a cultural dimension of all, all this too. The New Zealand government is presently consulting with Ngātahu concerning the Onslow impact, which is great. But I would really question whether the Ngātahu were ever consulted by the flooding Manawai forest, Lake Hawea forests, the loss of flows in the Waitaki River, and the destruction of the Waiau River. I'm sure they weren't. Okay, well, that's by way of background. Now, at least to some extent, we could be able to use Onslow, if we built it, to reverse some of this damage. Now, I'll raise the issue here of corporate good citizenship. Should the power companies really be chasing the last megawatt, the last drop of the turbines, always maximizing the incomes of the shareholders? So the shareholders want nothing more from the company than increased dividends. So let's look at one or one. Just a reminder, hydropower equals water pressure times water flow. Now, the late modern way, in fact, contributes nothing to water pressure. So it only has a seasonal effect in modifying the storage plant. So I would just raise the question, perhaps Pioneer Energy, who operate the Onslow Power Scheme, could lower the lake back to its original level. Help us replanting the shoreline forest, I guess there'd be carbon credits involved with that, and, okay, accept some seasonal income loss. There's an Onslow connection directly here too, because Pioneer Energy also owns some power stations downstream of Lake Onslow, um, and there's spill on that from time to time. So a great big dam right here would in fact eliminate the spill loss of the Pioneer stations further down the river. So hopefully, I don't know, there may just be a possibility that we could reverse and save the uh, Lake um, way back to the way it used to be. Oops. All right, go to a bigger picture now. Restoration of Lake Hawea. Could we seriously consider it? Quick overview of hydrology. Most of the wet weather wet rain is over here on the west coast. The Clutha River gains its flow from Hawea, Wanaka, and Wakata. The least flow comes from Lake Hawea because it's furthest uh, to the east. There are two major power stations here, the Clyde Dam and the Roxburgh Dam. The only storage control is, is where the least water comes out in Lake Hawea. That's why it's got to be worked so hard in order to actually be of some use to the Clyde Dam and the Roxburgh Dam in a commercial sense. Here are the two dams, the Clyde Dam and Lake Dunstan and uh, the Roxburgh Dam and Lake Roxburgh. But, because the only control is coming out of Lake Hawea, that still means that contact energy who operate these stations have limited seasonal control over the water going through these two stations. Okay, so let's just have a quick look at the hydrology of the two stations. 
Now the, the blue represents the actual flows and the orange flows without how, how we are storing. Note how different this is from the Waitaki because you haven't got that big storage upstream. And the scales here are the same. So what you see here is that the winter flows are lower and the spring flows are higher. But the spring flows, that's the time of lowish electricity prices. Now, contact does its best to lower the spring flows a bit and increase the winter flows a bit because that optimizes income. But it doesn't, it's not very much different, really. The big effect would be if I go ahead, there will be a much lower, higher price at the time of spring flows. So that means that the highest prices, or at least higher prices, will come in at the time of greatest discharge. And that represents an income gain to contact energy. So the hydrology and the and the actual commercial aspects are all interacting. So could we restore it? Well, kind of has to give up a bit. It has talked from time to time about putting a small power station on the Lake Hauwea Dam, which has raised Lake Hauwea. Um, we also have to give up those ups and downs of the control of the Hauwea River I showed you previously. In the detail, I'm just mentioning this in case this recording gets down to the South Island, people get concerned. The lake low would be lowered by increment to avoid dust issues. We'd have to make allowance for existing irrigation so there's no loss of water supply. We would need to replant uh, the ground forest. So there's a lot in that, but it's something worth discussing anyway. Okay, this starts to get really interesting now. The Waiau River, could we actually do something about that? What's happening now? Well, you probably see it on the headlines about talks about a giant hydrogen plant in Southland. And by the look of it, the aluminium smelt is going to stay open. They're undergoing negotiations now. I can't imagine Meridian really giving it up. They will get more money for it, but I'm sure TY Point will continue on. So the hydrogen plant is going to come from a large wind energy resource. Now, there is a very large wind energy resource in the southern Southland. I should know because I'm the person who discovered it. So if we, okay, just a quick explanation of this graph. This was my paper I wrote way back in 1980. Now, this is in the Cargo Airport. And as you go up, these numbers represent the wind energy flux at different levels. So this is a thousand watts per square meter. And that there is 500 watts per square meter. Now, when you can compare Christchurch and Invercargill, you'll see that those contours are much closer to the ground than Invercargill Airport. And importantly, the gradient is much greater. So, this is telling you if you put in giant wind turbines in Fabo Strait, up maybe a little max, about 200 meters up high, that will get a maximum amount of energy coming out of the wind there. It's a very large resource. Okay, so let's rework the water energy balance in the South Island and see what we can do with that. Okay, this is a busy diagram, so I'll hope we've got time to go over it. Right, let's start off with the environmental aspect. There's the Waya River flow now. Let's increase the minimum output from Lake Manapuri from 16 cumex right up to 125 cumex. So that pretty much re reverts the way our flow to about half what it was before. Looking something like the actual picture. Okay, so that means that the price we pay for that, we have to reduce output from the Manipuri power station, i.e., you have to cut down two of the seven generators, you only have five, and keep those two in as emergency reserve. That means a loss of about 170 megawatts of power. All right, so this is where our wind farm comes in. Now, a giant wind farm, of course, as wind always is, is intermittent. But if you combine a wind farm, a large wind farm, with Onslow, that represents a really massive power, power um, system, just as big, big or bigger than Manipuri. You've got the energy from the wind and the stability from Onslow. So I would argue that you can consider the two together. It's 100% renewable, but more than that, it's 100% reliable because we've got Onslow to back up the wind. Now that means, for example, that the TY aluminium smelter can keep going through a dry year. Presently, when a dry year comes along, they've got to turn down pot lines. Now that's got to be worth something to Rio Tinto because when the prices are high, they want, when the aluminium prices are high, they want to go out and produce as much aluminium as they can. Okay, so the rest of the power coming from this combo plant, Onslow plus South of Wind Energy, can go to the South of Industry, maybe Green Hydrogen, and into the national grid, which helps us with our green transition. So in other words, we're rearranging the renewables and making a partial transition from water power to wind power in South 
But I would argue also that Rio Tinto should consider contributing to the, uh, the construction cost of, of Wansley. Um, so, a, a, a call out to Meridian, contact Rio Tinto if they're seeing this recording. Do the right thing. Get in behind Wansley. Build your giant wind farms and give the kids and the country the Waia River back like it used to be, at least in that half like it used to be. Anyway. I think it's possible. It's just a question of having the right mindset. And again, this comes back down to corporate responsibility. Is it all about getting the last megawatt, getting the last dollar? There's got to be more to it than that. Okay. On the other hand, that, the previous uh, slide might generate a bit of controversy. On the Waitaki River, we re revisit that with respect to Onslow. Everybody wins. We don't need to change anything because the effect of Onslow coming into the market will be that we can actually level out the prices seasonally. There's no need to have that big seasonal storage anymore. So when the water gets high in Lake Tikapa and Pukaki, the prices uh, will be getting low, Onslow will pump, and that will take it back down to mid level and vice versa if the levels are trending down. So these extremes of spill that we might have next week and low levels will largely be a thing of the past, at least much reduced. And of course spill, that represents income loss to marine. So everybody would win on that sense, both in terms of the environment and in terms of the actual um, uh, commercial aspects. Just to put a number on it, if I had been operating back in 2009, that was a particularly wet period, or the beginning of a particularly wet period, there was around about 5,000 gigawatt hours lost to spillage. Now that represents the entire energy storage capacity of Lake Onslow. It also represents a large amount of money lost. Because if Onslow had been operational, that's the amount that would have been lost by spill to the Waitaki Power Station. So that's the economic half of the equation. The environmental half is that the ups and downs of Lake Pukaki would be so much less. So the blue is what actually happened, the red is what would have happened if Onslow had been operational in the market. Okay, we're not changing anything. We're simply saying to Meridian, do what's best in terms of for you in terms of the market. And this is what the outcome would have been. Good for everybody. And of course, we would have like um, Bukaki not so much high anymore causing that erosion. And that would apply to hydro lakes up and down the country. So Onslow is going to have a big impact if it goes ahead in that sense. Also, let's get back to Onslow specifically. There is going to be some local environmental impacts for, uh, for sure. Now, we have a big, big operating range. I would certainly like to see soil removed over that operating range. Otherwise, if it was drawn right down, we're going to have dust issues. Wouldn't look nice at all. And I couldn't really get a picture of what Onslow might look like at, at, at low levels, but this picture of Lake Mead gets some sort of a sense of it. There's the high level, it's going down. And you have, the idea is to have bare rock exposed, not soil getting blown all over the place. And if you sort of use your imagination right down there, you can get a sort of kind of a sense. There's a little bit of the bare rock exposed on the present Lake Onslow. So if you extrapolate that up over 30 meters, which equivalent to around about 35 square kilometers of rock exposed, that's roughly how it might look. Hopefully it will never happen. We're building more and more wind all the time. We might not never even need to go down that, that far. Another thing we could do is to landscape the Onslow Burst Dam to the surroundings. You know, I've got in the paper just a couple of days ago because the suggestion went out we could use concrete to build the dam. Well, there's a few reasons against it. One, of course, big pile of concrete, apart from looking terrible, is going to generate a lot of emissions. It's a bad look to actually go ahead like that. But also, there's a possibility, even though we need a much bigger volume, a bit more expensive, we make it worse than, we could maybe, just maybe, build it with hydrogen trucks, built by, from hydrogen actually generated at Lake Onslow itself. Wouldn't it be great to build a, a dam with renewable energy? And just think of the international recognition that we'd get, the world's first dam built with hydrogen. That would be great. But we certainly don't want it looking like, like Ben Boy Dam, great big massive thing like that, which screams out at you, this is a dam. It doesn't have to look like a dam. Another possibility. We actually could create a second lake on top, um, but purely as a natural lake. Now it might sound kind of a contradiction in terms to say a natural man-made lake. But what we would do is simply put a dam right there, and that would create a, a a lake, not quite as big as Onslow, but almost. 
and we could put that whole catchment into a upland reserve. Now that would, that dam would have no valves on it. It would just act as if it was a, a landslide. And in fact, that's what happened thousands of years ago in Lake Waikaramana. It was created by a landslide. You know, it's a beautiful lake. But we could do the same on a smaller scale by creating another lake up here. So what's going to happen? One of the things about the fishing issues at Lake Onva isn't necessarily so much about the loss of fishability. It's going to be the environment. Those of you who are keen fishermen or fishing people will know for sure that just as important as the fish biting is the environment that you're in. So I can't guarantee better fishing in the new lake up here, but for sure it would be a much better environment, it would be peaceful, it would have the same degree of solitude as Lake Onslow does now. And up in due course, um, wetlands would develop around the, the lake shorelines, and we could have this whole upland reserve to preserve some of the endangered species like the Tibia flatten. Just a very quick one here, this won't mean much to you. One offset also could be that the government might consider building a higher dam at the, the, to enable some of the flows to be higher in the Manuherakia River. Manuherakia River flows into the Kutha River um, at Alexandra, but it's suffering, it's a, it's, a con, it's a contentious issue right now because it flows so low, there's a lot of irrigation tanks going off. And one possibility could be that the government could, as an Oslo offset, build a higher dam up at Falls Dam, up in the Manuherakia headwaters, it would hold back for a spring uh, flood and release the uh, water during uh, summer, offsetting those rather awkward looking situations where we have the weed growing over at times of low flow in summer. But just purely a, a gift effectively uh, by the government to our target. Whether they would do it or not, I don't know, but it's worth mentioning anyway. So I'm anticipating some questions. Just going through quickly, I guess. What about the very rare, but very impactful dry year? In other words, how, what, about, what about two dry years in a row? How about North Island security of water supply, of power supply, if we have 100% renewable electricity coming up from the South Island? And anyway, where will the initial energy, those five terawatt hours, come from from raising Lake Onslow? Okay, going quickly through those. We could, in fact, have a backup to the backup, if Onslow would consider it as a backup. When I first wrote the paper back in 2005, I considered extending over to the upper Manaburn Reservoir. And it's possible by putting in a couple of small dams um, up here and up in here, you could by just simply by local streams coming in, you could build up quite a considerable energy reserve. It's, it's larger than Lake Tapa, it might even be as bigger than um, one terawatt hour in terms of storage. But the critical thing is to give yourself the option of having that sometime in the future, you have to build it before you raise Lake Onslow, otherwise, the tunnel is going to be submerged. Okay, well, what about North Island power security? Yeah. I would suggest that we could use, at least in part, Lake Taupo as North Island power security. Presently, it's operated in the same way as the South Island Hydro Lake, going up and down, up and down seasonally, because that best suits uh, income generation. I would argue that it would be rather better to keep the lake subject to two tough two far emissions around about the middle level. So that means that you have this reserve of about 280 gigawatt hours just in case something goes wrong and you need some power in a hurry. So that, in a sense, is at least partially the backup of security of supply for the North Island. If you have it down too low, then you're going to be taking away that security of supply. If you have it way up high, then that runs the risk maybe of flooding and spill back. So back in 1999, we had a major, uh, 1998, we had a major spill in the Waikato River. And if the lake had been lower, that might not have happened. So again, that's uh, a new way of operating. Just a reminder, the Bradford, the Bradford reforms didn't allow for 100% renewable power. They never foresaw it. So effectively, we're taking um, the... I know Mercury will be angry about this, but nonetheless, we're taking the Tapo, Lake Tapo out of the system in terms of a normal operating hydro lake for the greater good of the nation, i.e. particularly the North Island. And of course, as I mentioned, if you have lakes too high anyway, you can run the risk of spill. This was a, a shot taken uh, quite recently, July 14th. And around about then, there was 500 cubic meters of spill uh, going into the top of Lake Terapera. That's lost income. If the lakes had been lower, that, that spill might have been eliminated or at least reduced. Okay, initial energy. 
but with luck, if we struck a wet time, it could come from reduced spill luck, uh, spill, spill, luck spill loss. Um, we might even have a public power savings campaign. Previous camp power savings campaign have reduced our electricity use by about 10%, switch off to kill coal. Or indirectly, we could have maybe gas fired power, supply the North Island for a while, use some of the South Island power for pumping water up to the Gonsville. So that's an aspect which will have to be thought of in going into the future, should I'm going now ahead. We have to recognize there will be stranded assets. The North Island gas pipeline will no longer be viable. And it's a silly, pretty silly use of a pipeline to try and put hydrogen into it because it will leak, there will be um, mass movement, causing breakages, and so on. Much better to transport your hydrogen uh, through the um, national grid to create the hydrogen at the other end. Monthly power station become a, also a stranded asset simply because it will, the power price will never get high enough to allow it to operate. Up until the answer was created, if it's created, we could of course have as a backup. Uh, back in June, there was 5,000 gigawatt hours, same with the answer of storage, in, in, in the form of a big pile of coal at Hunter. So it can certainly maintain the power backup in that sense. Just a quick one on our research funding, death of my heart, I suppose. The problem with Andra, it is old technology. It's well-established technology. There's no buzzwords that I can use to get income um, to myself uh, in terms of research income. Uh, as compared, for example, to the advanced engine uh, technology platform, the call went out then for developing technology at the frontier of transporting the way we use, manage, and store our energy. Well, I store energy by putting water uphill. That's sort of front. But they would have put in a million dollars of funding for that, some of which actually come to Michael Wormsley's um, group and good on them for that. But I didn't see, and when you think of it, there's been 70, uh, up to $100 million spent on Anza itself, nothing at all on what's going on around in terms of the ASMR's thesis. So there's a little call out. It would be nice, maybe, if somebody out there looking at this as a recording might consider making a small donation through to Waikato University, which will help to keep our project going. We have done a little bit. We've done like a paper on the evaporation loss and published an item on whether how we could be restored or not. But we really could do with some extra funding just to keep us going, at least until we can finish um, the ASMR's thesis. OK, just finally. The funds, though, does go ahead. Truly, it really will be massive. And I'm forecasting by this time next year, it will be confirmed. Simply as an engineering project, it's huge. It can, it can be thought of as Manipuri and Benmore put together. It doesn't look like it, does it, when you just see some rolling hills? And that, that won't change all that very much, except the lake level will be that much higher. Um, it'll, it'll be an enabler at the national level by enabling um, renewable power stable through a dry year. And that in turn will enable the green energy transition where we move towards electrification of transport, industrial heating, the biggest change of energy we've ever had in New Zealand's history. And also in particular, it will enable the required new renewables to let it all happen, particularly wind. Originally, at Otago and Southland, there will be potential for um, climate change adaptation, economic growth, as I've already mentioned. And I would argue, I'm not by nature a tub thumper, but really, it would be the greatest ever research contribution to New Zealand that's ever happened from any new university. That gives me a, a feeling of pride, I guess. And even more so, it will be an example to the world how intermittent renewables uh, can power a nation through climate change simply by having a big enough, you know, provided you've got the geography, uh, storage uh, to take you right through it. I'd like this construction would give you something in the excess of 5,000 gigawatt hours of storage. That would represent the order of about half of the current energy storage by um, pump storage in the whole world. So it's a big deal, even global. Okay, and a special role of uh, of the School of Science. Our School of Science is not very big. We're an average university, I guess, in terms of scale. And it's really quite nice to think that a little School of Science like ours could actually have such a big role. We don't have to be a big university, so this is for the students. You can go ahead. If you think about a good idea, just because you're not in a great big university like Auckland or somewhere, we can contribute and make something useful from our research, which will have a lasting effect on the nation, extending far into the future. I think I'll leave it. Okay, I think we still have 10 minutes for Q&A. So, any questions?
Well, and the, and the rain is not raining. That, that, that's the definition of the, of the dry year. Yes, you're right. It's like about three months, maybe. Um, but you're, you're, I think if I understood you correctly, your, your question is well, why couldn't we use hydrogen uh, for. Yes, okay. So, the, the, oh, all right. So, you're talking about the large hydrogen plant in the in the south, in south. Uh, why aren't you rather than a private Well, this is only for storage. I'm a great believer in hydrogen in the sense of, of uh, replacing diesel in trucks. Um, I'm not against that at all. But in terms of hydrogen storage uh, to take us through a dry year, it's, in theory, it is possible. I mean, you could do it. But the real big thing against it is the inefficiency of the going from green electricity to, to create the green hydrogen, storing green hydrogen, using that green hydrogen back to the electricity in a dry year. The energy loss is greater than 50%. So if you want to get your 50, uh, sorry, your 5,000 terawatt hours, which we need for a dry year, you would need another 5,000 terawatt hours. In other words, 10,000 altogether to offset the inefficiency of that process going from the conversion of the green electricity back to green electricity again with hydrogen as the intermediary. Does inefficiency matter? Um, <laughs> you know, I guess my first cost is a factor. But... Yes, well, effectively, you, you, you've got to get the money to, to produce 5,000 terawatt hours, which is, which will, that will never happen. Hydrogen is, is, is large scale storage anywhere is never going to be. Oh, Peter? This is great. It's, it's been a great research contribution. I would like to see the university recognize this by putting your name forward to the uh, to the national, to the government effectively for the award of a, a Queen Service Medal. Well, thank you for that, Peter. Actually, just on, on that, that same topic, um, I'd, I'd like to see perhaps if this goes ahead, maybe the School of Science could rebrand itself as the School of Applied Science just to emphasize that we're, we're, we're a can do kind of place. So, my question is um, if I read your, um, your impact slide correctly, your, your setting is there no current upper or lower limit? In the electricity market? No, no. Sometimes it's gone up to ridiculous amounts of many thousands of dollars a megawatt hour. Other times it's gone down to zero. Sometimes even negative. Well, it's interesting that there is no mechanism to control the upper and lower price because the emissions trading scheme, <clears throat> the fundamental feature about that is that the government sets a lower and an upper price. And the Climate Change Commission has just recommended for 2023 to 2027, and it's advice to the government that those upper and lower limits be raised. So, just following on from that, <clears throat> what this would mean for the for the large energy the electricity generators is that they would need fewer staff in the working in the electricity trading business. Because, because there would be much more stability. And so if, if we think about that greater stability, you had a curve with a red line that showed much less fluctuation in price. What, what would be the impact over, say, a normal year for the generator's income if in the scenario where you had that stability in price or much greater stability in price, 
versus their trading where they're, they're effectively like a, um, a um, forex market where they're looking for gains out of small shifts in the market. Yes, they wouldn't be able to play the small shift gain, that's true. But on the other hand, the interest in price average, I don't think would be that very different. So in that sense, I think that there wouldn't be all that much change. And in fact, they might even make a bit more money by through saving a spill line. I mean, if you lose 5,000 gigawatt hours in a spill, that's a fair bit of money that you haven't made. Yes, yes. I mean, actually, what it would do is make the market more predictable. That they can plan better. Yes, and you wouldn't have to take out forward contracts like you do now, just hedging against a future dry year. And that, that will help industry. This would be the biggest shake up in the electricity pricing sales business. Ever. Yes. And that would be a good thing. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I think generally speaking, that would be that would be welcome. It would be particularly welcome by the big industry users. They don't want to have to worry about what the prices might be doing next year or the year after or whatever. They have to take out forward contracts as hedge, hedge co contracts to offset. Now, that costs money because the hedge people, of course, take into account the risk, and so they pay a lot more. Well, there have been some recent examples of failure in the market. Trans, um, trans power actually. Caused yeah. Um, yeah, winter. Um, so yeah, it would it would stabilize the market. Yeah, it would help for sure. Yeah. Yes, Keith Turner, the previous head of Meridian, um, is very strongly in favor of Onslaught for that reason. He said it's going to introduce stability into a pretty much a wild west electricity. Mm -hmm. 